All right, I am the Dance to Life dancer right here. And right now we're waiting in Gallery 326 uh, for a gallery talk. Remember what happened the last time I came here? The last time I came here when I went to that gas station, um, my wallet got stolen. Let's hope that doesn't happen this time. Just a little video, video ad for um, Facebook. I'm not gonna put this on the tube. This is just for Facebook. So this is me. I am the Dance of Life dancer. And I don't know, there should be somebody coming here by now. So um, anyway, that's the thing today. So thanks. Here I am again, the Dance of Life dancer. If nobody shows up by 15 till, I'm gonna go check this out. Because there should be somebody showing up here. Somebody hoping soon. Because uh, it starts at 6. I am the Dance of Life Dancer. We are back at the Art Center, the Art Museum. And it's supposed to be a talk here. It's supposed to be Gallery 326. And here we are at the Gallery 326. So we're going to see what happens. Um, Somebody should show up soon here. I mean, somebody somewhere soon. Other than that, we're gonna find out, I guess. See what happens. It's a little short video it about the um, my um, second back trip back to the art museum since my wallet got stolen, and uh, we're gonna find out what happens. This is what the talk is, right? Uh, I'm not sure. Oh. Yeah, because there's nobody uh, here. They told me. G5 or G7. All right. Well, we're about 22 minutes away from this, and there ain't nobody here yet. We'll see what happens here. Should be very interesting how we go. Something interesting, horrible. Geez, I wish I knew you were going to bring them chairs up there. I bought one from all the way downstairs. Did you? Oh, Susan, I always bring chairs. You just got to, but if your legs don't hurt, you need to sit. Well, remember when I was here last time? Mm -hmm. Remember all that? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Take a seat. Are you going to sit? Oh, I don't sit. Oh, you don't sit. Well, okay. Remember the last time when I came here and when I left, mm -hmm. I went to that gas station down here, you know, that, what, that Circle K? Oh, yeah? And uh, somebody stole my wallet. At the Circle K? The one on Del Mar? No, the one on Grand Avenue. Oh. You know, it's right there by that round coffee yeah. place. Mm -hmm. And, oh, I had a meltdown. I mean, you don't uh, like all my money and my credit cards and yeah. everything was in there. And like that, it had been for that lady. You know what I mean? Did, did you? Did somebody find it? Or? Oh, nobody found it. Nobody ever found it. I'm still replacing stuff. They took somebody took up a don donation. Oh. I got all the money back. You know. Oh, I'm sorry. But man, I'm that. telling you, it was a nightmare. That's, I'm sorry. Yeah, all your belongings, right? Yeah, ID. but I, I might have got all of that stuff back, but I can't get the pictures back. Right. I can't get the, you know, personal information I had back from different places. Right. Oh, I'm sorry, Susan. If one for that lady, she took up a donation. Get this one, you know, and I, I heard this yesterday. I had my hair done, you think? Oh, nice. I had, um, I heard yesterday when I went to that, um, 
place to get my hair done. Mm -hmm. But some people on both sides of the river actually were not dressed for Halloween and said that to life. Oh! Do you take that as a compliment? Yeah. I'll be right back. I'm going to to the restaurant. Okay. Nobody here for this gallery talk today. This is Susan. <laughs> Hi, Susan. So you're in the right place, Susan. He's going to start with this work of art. Okay, am I in the right place sitting right here? You're good. Okay. You're good. That's a, you know what? Mm -hmm. I'm going to pick that one because that's an interesting piece. You think so? I th Yeah, I like it. There's all that stuff on there and everything. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting. Yes. It's going to be interesting to hear the story about that. Yeah. He's got good stories. So you'll enjoy it, Alex. Oh, yeah. If you need a chair or anything, you know, no, can I put my bag down? I Anywhere. I check it, but they said no. Really? Yeah. Because <laughs> I didn't want to have to go back to my desk. I didn't know you were going to put this. Oh, I can see one. Yeah, I can do one, too. But I didn't realize that. I didn't either. I was like, oh, that'll be fine. I'm just going to take a seat and talk to me. <gasps> I can't sit. Yeah. I'm waiting for the talk. <laughs> A little bit you can't dance too much. Are you we're, getting, we're getting there though. Getting there? We're getting better, but by the time the next one comes, probably. You'll be know? ready after Thanksgiving? Probably. Okay. I hope I'll so. I'm looking for you. I, I hope, hope so. As well. What did your doctor say? He says three months. Three months? And when did it happen? In September the 28th when I got the surgery. Okay. But uh, I give people, everybody's expectations away when it comes to this stuff. Yeah. Because most people tell me I'm supposed to be still on the walker at a month. Were you actually on the walker? For about five days. Okay. And then you left the walker and started using the cane? Yeah, I used a smaller cane, especially these crutches, then the walker, and then a bigger cane than this one. Okay. Are you I, I walked around my house yesterday with able to, without that. Yeah. Did you feel okay? A little bit more to go, but... Yeah, because you said after the, um, you did something and after you were in pain. Yeah, I mean, sometimes I walk up, you know, too much, it's too much, yeah. it's too much, but we're, we're, it's getting better, you know. It's, of course it's getting better, just now, as I said last, when did we see each other last? Last week? Or the week no, before? No, the week before, when yeah. that, 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 was a, that was a bad day. Yeah, you said you were in pain, and then, then you and you want to know something? Then you Somehow or another, when I was out there, I totally forgot all about this. Did you? I was running around out there trying to find you. Because you were so angry. Well, angry isn't the word for it. I won't use Terrified the is the word for yeah. it. Your wallet was stolen here at the gas no, station. No, my wallet was stolen at the at the oh. at the uh, gas station up on Grand Avenue, mm -hmm. and it was terrifying. Oh. The lady had to buy ten dollars of gas for me. Oh my gosh! She took up her collection and stuff, you know. And so I did get home. Did you live in Illinois, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. And I love to get it, you know, because I can't use it with this cane, you know? Yeah. And it's hard to carry that in there. I, I had a bad habit of leaving my car open and stuff out there. Do you? Susan, well, I used to. Susan. I don't now. Okay. The only thing about it is, you know, I can't, you know, with this thing, you know what I mean? I try to carry stuff. I've dropped my drinks yeah. on, the, on the ground, you know? And the other thing is that, you know, I'm a fast in and out, you know? Yeah. I have to fumble around. Did they take it from your car? Yeah, they went inside, they took the camera back. The guy stopped at the gas station mm -hmm. with the black car, you know, didn't buy any gas, walked around, threw something away and went around my car three times and then opened the door. And then opened the door while you were inside. And nobody ever found out who it was or nothing. Like, that's like a, that's like a... You canceled all your credit cards, right? I didn't have credit cards, I only had one bank card. Okay. But, you know, i got to worry about identity theft and all that crap now, you know? Yes. There are stools right outside that doorway if you want to grab one. Well, we ain't got anybody here for this tonight, or? We got, we got you. Well, of course. <laughs> That's somebody, right? That's I'm it. here. I want to see it. That's right. There you I go. I didn't get to go yesterday. Have Not you met Deborah you... Spivak? She's, huh? she's new to the art museum. Semi so new. You oh, you work, you work here? Yeah, I'm a, a Mellon fellow. Has it been three, three months? months? Yeah, it's been three months. Mm -hmm. I'm here for this year. Yeah. I did my hair. I have my hair done. You told me. You went to the hairdresser. And they, like I said, they is that told, blue and green earrings or is that your hair? That's trolls. Oh. Okay. They, they told me that um, 
you know, in the dental life, they told me that there was people that went out dressed as a dental life for Halloween. <laughs> and I had pictures of some of one of them. That was interesting. It's six o'clock now, actually. Somebody blinked. Are you the lecture guy? I am. How are you? Um, the exhibition opens to members today, so if you're in the building and you want to go over and see Tomas Struz, Nature and Politics, you should be able to get in today after the gallery talk. Um, you can also get in tomorrow. It opens to the public on Sunday, and on Sunday we have a discussion with the artist. He will be here at 2 p.m. He will be joined on stage by our curator, Eric Glutz. Um, and a professor from SIUE, oh no, WashU, excuse me, Tali Dan Cohen, and um, James Beecham, who is a particle physicist from the Large Hadron Collider. So that's Sunday at 2 p.m. if you guys are interested and you want to learn a little bit more about the intersections of art and science and Tomas Struz and his photography. Our speaker tonight is Alex Marr. Alex Marr came to the St. Louis Art Museum um, in January 2016. He's coming up on his two-year anniversary. He is our assistant curator of Native American art. Um, he served as Mellon Pre-Doctoral Fellow in Native American Art at the Portland Art Museum, where he contributed major research to a forthcoming traveling exhibition of the Axel Rasmussen Collection of Northwest Coast Art. And please give Alex a big round of applause. He just finished his PhD, so he has stopped. And so he's going to be speaking to you tonight about art of Northwest Coast. That's what I do. Alex there you go. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you. Um, thank you all for, for joining us this evening. It is a great pleasure to uh, spend the next hour with you in one of my favorite places. Uh, we're in the gallery for the Northwest Coast, for Northwest Coast and Arctic Art here at the St. Louis Art Museum. And we're going to be looking at uh, what I think is some of the best work to be made in North America and indeed the world. We're going to be looking at some really fantastic things this year. Um, so, this relatively small gap in the United States, about 500 years ago or so. Um, there's the basic cultural lay of the land for that very large region. Um, I'd like to talk about a few specific artistic traditions within that wide region. Uh, and I'd like to begin by talking about this wonderful carving. Uh, this carving represents, well first, I should say that it was made by a Yupik artist. Uh, in southwestern Alaska at the very beginning of the 20th century. Um, and what we're looking at here is the representation of a shaman. Uh, shamanism is a circumpolar Arctic religion uh, defined by uh, individual, individual uh, specialists, religious specialists, who are recognized for their uh, extraordinary powers to speak with the spirits of animals, to travel to the moon, and to other ways uh, transcend the limits on ordinary existence. So what we're seeing here is not just a representation of a shaman, but a representation of the way that shamans view, the way that they, they see the world. Um, so of course the central figure, which would have been worn as a mask, represents a shaman with a large uh, librette there. And then we can see around the face are these two rings. These are bent wood rings. Uh, and they represent the layers of the universe. Uh, the, and so beyond the rings, on the outer limits of this mask, uh, we see two hands and two feet. And so we, here the shaman is reaching through beyond the bounds of the visible world to uh, come into proximity with the, not the individual animals themselves, uh, not specimens, but the spirit of the animals, uh, which controls them. So this mask is meant to show the way in which uh, shamans exercise their power through extraordinary vision uh, and uh, touch. So the Yupik are very well known for their uh, uh, wooden carved masks. Uh, there's a wonderful uh, complex of winter dancing uh, in Yupik Men's House and the Kosliks. Uh, and typically masks are 
paired. So I'm not sure if this one has a pair. Uh, I think this type of mask is more individual. But often you'll see, for example, masks of uh, cranes transforming into humans, uh, which are paired, or raven transformation masks, which are paired. Uh, Epic dancers also use finger fans, which are equally as important as the masks. Um, so there's really a wonderful complex. Here's another um, Upic mask at top over here. Um, otherwise, in this case, we're looking at work by a Nubiac artist. Uh, yes. I have a question about that mask. Please. What does the, the little thing represent that comes this out of this chin? Yes. Um, I believe that it represents a librette or a lip plug. Um, but it's certainly open to interpretation. What, what do you see? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I was curious. You're the expert. <laughs> it did cast. I was surprised. Yes, yeah, yeah. It is an unusual, unusual thing. Mm -hmm. um, great, great question. Um, so again, one more wooden Yupik mask at top there. And then otherwise, we're looking at bone and ivory carvings by a Nubia artist, the northern neighbors to the uh, it was a very, very valuable uh, thing in uh, India in the 16th century. Um, and you can get ivory um, that's, if it's been in the um, by, by developing this privileged board form. This particular board has a fascinating history. Um, it was collected by a woman who was born in St. Louis uh, named Helen Hutchins Miller. Um, in the 19th century. Uh, she collected it about 1903 or 1904 in Nome. Uh, of course, Nome. So um, she was living in this book in the 1950s. Um, based on those earlier religious wooden masks, um, but also based on Halloween masks, which started showing up in Alaska Native communities in the 1950s. Uh, so this is uh, uh, carved from a whale vertebrae. Uh, of course, all of our bones have this porous structure, but in an animal the size of a whale, uh, we, can, we can really see what that looks like. OK, so that's my very, very brief introduction to Alaska Native vertebrae just completely collapses. So there are now a new generation of people who have grown up in these villages. Uh, they've severed their uh, uh, ties to subsistence lifestyles. Um, and this constituted a, a pretty major problem for the Canadian government. Uh, so what the, what the federal government of Canada did was establish a series of artist workshops in, in uh, to the mouth of the Nas River, which forms the border of uh, the United States and Canada, through the Southeast Alaska Panhandle. So that's about 2,500 miles. Uh, and it also includes a great range of cultural diversity. Um, but there are certain features of Northwest Coast cultures that enable us to speak about it as a consistent cultural region. Uh, there's also a great diversity in art making in this region uh, from the north to the south. We're mostly going to be talking about northern and northwest coast uh, art today. So we're going to be talking about the Klingit, or the northernmost. Uh, Haida carvers, Haida and Simshin carvers, and we'll also be talking about the central groups of the New Chalk and Wakawak. Um, let's just start by looking at this. What, what do you all, uh, can I have a volunteer? What do you see here? Um, let's, let's try to make sense of this together. It's a bird. It's a bird, okay. Why do you say that? <clears throat> I see a beak with two nostrils. Mm -hmm. and uh, kind of a hook. Uh, okay. Characteristic of a carrion eating bird. Very good. Hunting bird. Mm -hmm. oh. Anyone else? <laughs> what else do we see? Eyeballs. Mm -hmm. Right, there are some very large disproportionate eyes here in relation to the beak. And at the bottom. Yes, yeah, and at the bottom as well. It's kind of repeating forms. It looks pretty heavy. I don't know where you would hang or, or set this thing. Mm -hmm. uh, on the side of the wall or in the ground. I don't know if the, the kind of cross section. Represents an eagle uh, or a raven or a hawk. And, and that does make a difference because uh, this is a wonderful example of something that we call crest art. So this bird. 
um, even though we don't know uh, exactly which group made and used it because it's a pot, because it's a copper. We know that this is a crest of a collective, probably a clan, which is uh, one of the most significant uh, levels of social organization in Northwest Coast societies. Uh, Northwest Coast societies are highly stratified and they have a number of levels of organization. So your most basic unit of affiliation is the house that you live in, uh, which is a communal structure. Northwest Coast villages consisted of very large who've produced a number of very famous totem poles. Uh, the Kiksadi take as their crest the frog uh, because it's said that the founder of the Kiksadi clan married a frog. So uh, every descendant of that relationship had a special, special claim to frogs. Um, crests were, are represented on potlatch copper such as this, on house screens as I mentioned. For the Klingon, one of the most important uh, crest Press items is a hat, a woven spruce root hat, um, which depicts the claim there, a uh, claim a crest there, and is the ultimate symbol of authority within a clan. Exactly a mask that would have been worn on the forehead like this. And you'll see there's a, just a wonderful wealth of this uh, uh, iridescent shell, which is abalone shell. Now there is a species of abalone that lives on the northwest coast, but its shell is white, so it's not of great use to northwest coast artists. Uh, instead, this would have been sourced from California and likely traded at the Dow. Uh, so this is material, uh, this is a new chalk artist working in the central northwest coast area. So this material would have been sourced from 2,500 or 3,000 miles away. Uh, it was a luxury item, absolutely. So that's right here, the other copper. Is that being mined and produced and processed locally, or is that coming in via trade? Uh, this is industri industrially milled no. copper. Um, there are sources for copper in the Northwest Coast. Uh, especially in C, is made up of these various uh, di individual design units, which have been carved in relief from the surface of this, of this bowl and, and stem here. And then they're united within uh, this ridge, this uncarved area, which forms a total composition here. This is the basic system of art making that art historians now call form line. That's not a term that Northwest Coast artists were using in the, in the 19th century, but it's, it's, it's what we call the style of art, the style of crest art today. Um, often uh, hosts of potlatches would commission artists uh, non-relative artists, so the opposite. One member of the host plan would have done was uh, walk over to, so there are particular, there are oil dishes, uh, many of which are soaked all the way through. So when they're sitting in shelves in museum storerooms, they're actively dripping oil today <laughs> because they were so heavily used. But they're bent wood boxes, so they're a single piece of wood on the side, one plank that has been curved, it's kind of been scored in certain places, steamed and then folded on itself to create a container and then a bottom is fastened to that. These, unfortunately we don't have oil dishes in our collection, I really wish I could show you one right now, but um, if, you, if you just Google them you'll, you'll see them. And they have a really wonderful bulging form and that bulging form kind of reinforces association with abundance and wealth. And, mm -hmm. uh, so a host, uh, a host would dip this in, in that uh, dish full of oil and then walk around the house to distribute it to all of the guests, mm -hmm. either pouring it over the food that they were eating, such as smoked salmon or, or dried salmon or um, berry cakes, or people would just drink right out of the ladle. Mm -hmm. the other Latch. Um, some of these were, were particularly spiritual in nature, um, some were more civic. It's, it's hard to uh, make a distinction between uh, sacred and profane, as we were talking about earlier today. Um, but performance was a very important aspect of potlatches. Uh, so I mentioned that this is not a mask, it's a frontlet, something that would sit on the forehead. Uh, and this would have been used specifically in a dance called the Peace Dance which originated in Simshan communities and then spread to the Haida and the Klingit. We're really only looking at one piece of an ensemble here, uh, the, the central carving. 
Um, and we can see that the artist has, it's, it's a number of pieces of wood here that have been attached uh, using sinew and other means. Um, and it's, it's a, it, it really is a wonderful thing. This is one of my favorite objects in the museum. Um, one of the reasons I like it so much is that it reflects its cosmopolitan side of, of production. So even though it was made for internal use, uh, we talked about the uh, exotic abalone shell that was used there. There's another reflective surface on this mask. If you look closely at the eyes, this is mirrored glass uh, used in the eyes, set, set within these deep holes, uh, which are created basically by washers. Um, and then uh, the, the blue on the face of this raven and the small face underneath and the wings um, was, was uh, achieved by using laundry bluing, Ricketts laundry bluing. Uh, so an industrially produced base in fact represent raven. And when raven is, is shown with his, his beak slightly open and, and a ball in there, uh, that's illustrating a widespread story about the, the origin of the world, really. Uh, a lot of Northwest Coast peoples tell a story about uh, ravens stealing all of the light in the universe from a box that was uh, kept jealously guarded in the house of a, of a man who lived deep in the forest. So Raven is a trickster figure on the Northwest Coast. Uh, Raven transformed to trick this person to enter his house and eventually got the box open and flew away, bringing uh, the sun, the moon, all the light, the stars, all the light to the universe. Um, so I wanted to tell you this story because uh, these reflective elements, this great array of abalone along the, along the top, which kind of resembles rays of, of light um, cresting, um, as well as the reflective elements in the eyes. You know, this would have been danced in a, a large, dark house in front of a fire. And when it was danced, it would have reflected various qualities of light, both from the abalone and the mirror, all across the room. So this would have reinforced the associations with uh, the, the story in this carving here, that Raven brought the light. Um, we're really only looking at one piece of an ensemble here. This was worn on the, on the forehead. And then it would have had sea lion whiskers sticking up, uh, up above it, so probably about another two feet above, there would have had sea lion whiskers. There would have been white ermine tails with, with black tips hanging kind of from the ears. Uh, and then there would have been a train, a, a kind of veil made out of canvas or swan skin, covering the head of the dancer, the head and shoulders of the dancer. And then inside this train was a cache of uh, eagle down uh, and a device to distribute the down. Uh, so when the dancers moved, this is a, a group dance. There are usually about four or five people dancing in. Um, when they moved, there would have been this down floating all over the place, and it would have created just a, a wonderful uh, sense of energy and, and movement. And there are uh, videos of the peace dance online. You can go to YouTube and, and watch some of the contemporary renditions. And it, it's really quite lovely. So the dancer would have worn that whole ensemble, and then would have worn a woven blanket uh, on his back, and then a tape in, in the front. Um, OK, any questions about, about what we just covered? OK, so um, we talked about <coughs> similar, very similar to or, or different from the style of carving that we've been looking at so far today. And it's very different. It is really different. Different. Yeah. First of all, it's three-dimensional. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So we have our limbs mm -hmm. that are extending from the body that are fully articulated. Absolutely. Right. There's kind of a, we get a sense of the exact conditions of this body. Um, it is in a state of emaciation, <laughs> which we can tell from the clearly articulated ribs here, uh, and the skin that is pulled taut. You can see these wrinkles uh, around the jaw and at the edges of the, of the lips there, uh, and, a, and a general uh, thinness to the body. So this represents a, a shaman. Um, we know it's a shaman because of his hairstyle. So he's 
probably pulled his dreadlocks up in a, in a top knot here. Walton is looking at an existing form of Klingon art, right, grease, grease dishes, um, and uh, imagery on it, bears, and carving it in a style uh, that he's more familiar with. Um, and he's emphasized then uh, his Klingon credentials uh, by doing a very uh, kind of rigid study of the form line style of, of etching on either side of this bowl. Uh, so it's a really wonderful fusion of um, uh, form line and naturalistic carving and uh, speaks to uh, something that happened throughout the 20th century, which was uh, Native Northwest Coast artists looking to historical art, learning from historical art, rather than apprenticing for masters uh, in an effort to um, maintain and in some cases revitalize um, their cultural traditions that have been. Are you one of the ones given the lecture, or are you one of the ones here for the lecture? I'm just listening. Nobody's here yet. Huh? <laughs> He's here. He's practicing. <laughs> the chairs are over there. Thanks. I'm going to stand for a while. Yeah. All day.